That will that never, never work. work. You can't, you can't push, push us. us. Seriously? No, 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 Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Welcome to episode 102 of Horrible Writing. I'm your host, Paul Sading, and one of the things this show has always done in its history is talk about the author journey over craft. There's a billion shows of people much more successful and smarter than I about the writing craft. I don't want to do that. I wanted to always take another angle. This time around, I'm really honing in on the journey aspect of something related to maybe considered more of the business side of writing. And I have an absolutely phenomenal author who's going to come on and talk about it with me. We're going to talk about editors, uh, maybe horrible editing stories, how an editor can maybe kill a career. And I have with me none other than Peter Arulian, a epic fantasy author. You may know him from his tour books, the Vault of Heaven series. And he does some other stuff, including a very cool project from the progressive metal band back in the day, still today, but kind of back in my teen years, Dream Theater. Those of you who know about Dream Theater, He uh, worked on a book called The Astonishing uh, off of their concept album. Really cool project. Peter, welcome to Horrible Writing. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. You uh, and I did some chatting offline. Of course, like always, I do with all my guests about topics and how we can center that around the author, aspiring author, blooming writer journey. And you proposed one that I get a lot of questions about. And when I told... Uh, the secret Facebook group for this show that you were coming on and what you were going to be talking about. And I said, Hey, let me know if you want anything specific. I could ask Peter. I got flooded with (laughs) with questions as you can imagine. So um, there's a lot of people interested in this topic and you were really cool. And, and fans of this show know it's all about empowerment through candor. And I've seen you speak. I've seen you present on numerous panels up at Norwest con in Seattle folks. If you're in, the Seattle area on Easter weekend, or you can get here. That is one of the best uh, bang for your buck conferences you'll ever be able to attend because it has Peter people like Peter there sharing their insight. So before we get into the dirty details of your editing story, your editor story, can you kind of give us an idea, a little fun here, what's worse, editors or agents? Huh. Well, it... it- uh, it depends on your editor and your agent. Um, they they come in um, flavors. The on the agent side, there are agents who um, behave like editors, and they um, they will alert you to the fact that once you sign up with them. Um, and by the way, sign up uh, is kind of in air quotes because uh, most agencies don't have a formal agent author agreement. Um, a lot of it is the terms are are fairly consistent um, and standard across the industry, but um, there's few that actually do a written agreement. So writers need to decide if that's important to them. Um, but the the agents, some of them want to get in deep and they want to participate in some of the story, um, you know, uh, suggest changes. Obviously, at the end of the day, the writer makes the decision, but um, a recalcitrant writer may find an agent that wants to be deeply involved, um, you know, kind of not as interested to to represent an author who won't take input. Um, and then on the other end, there are those who uh, really just mail. They just they just mail your work in. And so the writer needs to decide what they want from their agent if they if they're glad to take input and they trust the agent, then that's a good match. But I know writers who don't want any 
input from an agent. All they want the agent to do is have the connections with the editors, mail the manuscripts, and get the deals done. So, um, you know, and then there's also a, a, a stripe of writer who doesn't want an agent at all. Um, they don't want an intermediary who's taking a percentage. Um, so, you know, writers need to make these decisions on on what works best for their career. Uh, and with a, with editors, it's kind of the same. There are editors who are super aggressive and they just really redline in a very heavy handed way, almost get, um, influencing the voice of the manuscript um, all the way to uh, editors. And these stories are legion uh, in the in the writing circles of uh, editors who um, are so busy. Uh, and I understand this, but they're so busy that their their editorial input is very, very limited. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you get is they still represent the books internally at at all of the appropriate meetings, but they they're more like shepherds for getting the book through the process um, versus uh, the sort of older romantic idea of editors who cultivate talent. Um, we don't live in an age anymore where a talented writer can be groomed and, and grown over time to build an audience. We live in a in an entertainment era where books need to be find immediate hit success. Uh, otherwise, the writers will find themselves very quickly out of a contract or out of a publisher. With your own personal journey, um, every, the audience for this show are – like I said, like we chatted about newer writers, aspiring authors, maybe a few folks who have a book or two or a collection out there of poetry, but we don't have an extensive library as a collective for the most part. When you were an, a younger writer approaching this journey of dealing with your first editor, can you kind of give us a little bit of a backstory to who you were, what you had been through, and then post that first editing experience what did what did that journey what did those experiences teach you well um i spent a lot of time trying to develop my craft and this is um there's still a lot of writers who do that increasingly there are writers who i think are are um short circuiting that process in the interest of getting their books listed with amazon and other places because Publishing, self-publishing is so easy to do now. Um, and, and, you know, distribution, at least through online retailers, is so easy to do now. So there's a, a significant number of, call them young writers um, or new writers, that I don't, I don't think they spend as much time on the craft of writing as they probably should. The truth is, is that, that never should end. Mm -hmm. um, the, the desire to... to always write your best book and you know, learning new tricks of the trade um, elements of craft that should never end. Uh, and I, so I spent a significant amount of time um, building my craft, uh, which isn't to say that I've arrived by any means. I, I still make tons of mistakes and I'm still learning. Um, but that, you know, that process included, uh, principally and most importantly, reading a lot and writing a lot. There's no substitute for practice. And um, the first many, many, many books you write should be considered just that. And you may sell some and um, have some success. But the truth is, is that it takes many books to really get into a place where um, you're writing at a mature level. And, um, you know, you can supplement that with going to conferences and um, you know, if you're if you're the kind of person who feels like they need or would benefit from writers groups, these are these are additional elements. Of course, there are, there are books and there's a whole cottage industry on um, books about writing. And some of those are good and some are less good. The best way to find those is through recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did that for a long time. And then um, my story to publication is kind of boring because. Uh, although every story is different, mine is kind of um, traditional in that I submitted to an agent. Um, the agent liked my writing, but um, he didn't like the particular book that I had sent him. Um, so he, uh, but I found that he represented more than one genre. And so I sent him, I had sent him originally a thriller novel and um, 
when I saw that he represented Robert Jordan, I said, well, I've written a fantasy. And the fantasy had been on the shelf for eight or 10 years, but um, I figured, why not? So I sent it to him. He really liked it. And he sent it to Tor, and I wound up with my deal. So it was really kind of the standard, you know, f- find an agent, the agent sends it to the publisher, the publisher buys it, which is the kind of old tried and true. Mm-hmm. Um, then once I got it, once it was bought by Tom Doherty, um, I got a three book deal. I was assigned an, an, an editor internally, and that editor had been had been the editor for um, one of their other big fantasy writers. Um, not not Jordan, but he'd been the editor for probably their second largest epic fantasy writer. And um, I didn't know any better uh, because I'd never been in it. And, and of course, you kind of step lightly because you right. these are. <laughs> yeah, these are relationships of trust. And, and um, you're, you know, you're young. You don't want to uh, upset the apple cart. So um, I took all the editorial input really well. Um, I made a bunch of suggestions at the very outset uh, because the book was had been on the shelf for so long. And I, I, to- I sent an epically long email to this editor saying, look, I- I'm a far better writer than this manuscript represents given when it was written. And my vision on the story has changed. But he summarily dismissed all of that and proceeded. <laughs> um, and I, I didn't kind of stand my ground on that. Mm-hmm. And um, that's the biggest learning I had is that, there, there's a diplomatic way to be firm, and um, and you, and the writer needs to gauge how how to navigate that with the personality of the editor they're paired with. Um, but you know, your yours is the name on the cover. Um, now, of course, the publishing company can always elect to not publish a book. Usually, their contracts stipulate that. But um, you know that that's part of the art of um, gauging the person. Uh, the editor and what's really important to you in the manuscript and stand firm on those things. You you have to acknowledge that they have a certain expertise and um, that you're, you know, you're, you know, you're paying for that as a manner of speaking. Um, You're hoping that they're coming to it with all the best intentions and a good work ethic Mm -hmm. and, and experience. Um, But in my case, I wound up with an editor who um, had, uh, and I didn't know this, but had quite a reputation for over editing. Um, he was bilocated from the office. And so it was, it, it um, became, there was some scrutiny on just how much he was actually working. He had some personal things going on um, that I think were dividing his attention. Um, he was later um, fired from tour for sexual misconduct so th- there was just a bunch of stuff and like i so i had this like in, in addition to all of that he was notorious on his wait times so you know um he wouldn't even look at book like when i turned in my second book i had to wait i was waiting for a year before um i he even looked at the book so i didn't it was um perfect storm of badness with this particular editor and i wound up um, I wound up requesting through through my agent an editor change. Uh, and there is this kind of unwritten industry sort of not rule, but but guideline that, that suggests that sometimes author uh, editor relationships are just bad pairings, just like bad marriages. And it's kind of a gimme. And so if it's just not working, maybe you just need a different editor. And Tor certainly was that way. And I, I got moved to another editor just before and and unbeknownst to me before my editor was fired um so it was the 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 unfortunate consequence for me is that um all of the things i wanted to change about that first book but he but was disallowed uh to do so became the very things that um, manifest themselves in negative reviews Mm -hmm. and so um it was it was a momentum killer and it's very hard to recover from those kinds of things because that first book sets the tone for the series. Right. Um, so, you know, when you're writing a series and um, you're you're paired with an editor uh, and there's enthusiasm and all these good things, you at the end of the day, the, the writer really needs to um, be sure that the book that goes out is a reflection of, you know, their intent and um, mine. 
uh, unfor- now the good the good news was later Tor allowed an uh, what they call an author's edition, um, where all of this stuff came to light and th- the book was republished as an author's edition with most of the changes I had wanted, which is great. Um, but again, the in in some respects it was too late. Um, so while I've I've had some success with that series, it was not the breakaway success that anybody wanted. Mm-hmm. And um, while you'll never know for sure, um, I I sometimes I wonder if you know if I had been a little bit firmer about the change and insisting on the changes that I had wanted, if things had wouldn't have panned out differently from a sales perspective for me on that series. Oh yeah, abs- un- absolutely understandable. Peter, thank you for sharing that. It's obvious that obviously not all editors are created equal. I'm curious, uh, sharing that very candidly, which I do appreciate. One of the things I love being able to deliver to listeners of the show are what I call, I'm a ex-military guy. So we're big on tips, tools, and tactics. We talk about that in our debriefs all the time. So Peter of today, reflecting back on that, Peter, what are some of the tips, tools, and tactics that you would share with younger writers specifically about maybe being, if you, you know, in a perfect world, if you had more influence and control, how you would have dealt with that editor editor and that situation in the moment, uh, assuming, of course, that you had the power to do that. What can newer writers do now to prepare themselves and actually maybe be able to put the brakes on something like that, that they feel is running away from them? that could result in what you just talked about with the the sales outcome? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think that it's, it, mine is sort of a very unique story. Um, but, you know, if you found your, if a writer found themselves in that kind of a situation, I, I think one of the recourses they need to be able to have is, is with their agent. And so one of the candid questions that a writer can talk to an agent about when they're in that sort of courtship period on whether or not they're going to work together is, you know, maybe run a scenario like this. Like, you know, let's say, you know, really at an impasse with my with my editor, you know, to what degree is the agent, you know, able and willing to get involved to help mediate something like that. And I think it's rare. I I don't hear tons of stories where there's this kind of impasse. Um, But if as a writer, if you're convinced that what's going on with the book is going to have a negative effect on your career and the editor is just intractable, um, I think the, the author needs to, I mean, you first try and work it out with the editor, but if that's not going to find resolution uh, then I think the agent needs to be able and willing to step in. And what that means is some agents don't want to uh, cre- you know, get involved in, in contentious discussions because I think they're worried about the, the uh, rub off effect that might have on their relationship with the editor, the potential to sell to the editor, um, other books from other writers. Um, so you, you need an agent who's willing to do that and maybe has the, the negotiation skills to do that with diplomacy and tact. Um, and that speaks to the second thing I, I said, which is the ability. Um, being able to do it is different from being willing to do it. Mm-hmm. And, and so you have to have confidence that the agent um, has the, the right level of either um, weight. Like if there are some agents that represent so many writers and have such industry weight that um the editors will stipulate to, you know, the things that they may come and ask or request on behalf of the author. Um, agents that don't have that kind of a client list or reputation uh, are going to need to rely on great negotiating skills and diplomacy. And so if the agent that you have or considering either doesn't have the heavyweight list or name um, or the skills to mediate, you know, rough patches, then you can still work with that agent, but then you kind of go in knowing that if you hit some bumps, it's going to be on you to mm-hmm. to navigate them. What would you, okay? Just for context, so so you're aware, and maybe it might help you form or frame your response. A good number of listeners are pursuing the trade route. They're 
is obviously a huge contingent that are also indie already, or that's the route that they're going to take for themselves when it comes to publishing. So with that framework, what would you say to a newer writer when it comes in, when, in terms of looking for your editor, looking for what you want out of an editor, and for the, obviously for those indies who are out on their own looking for editors, what would a writer need to know about themselves before they go on that hunt for an editor? Well, you know, a valuable thing to know about yourself as a writer is what your strengths and weaknesses are. And every writer's got them. There's no writer that's good at all of the elements of craft. Um, you know, a couple of examples with big names. You can look at someone like um, uh, Sanderson, Brandon Sanderson. He is he is masterful at plot. Um, uh, by contrast, if you look at someone like Pat Rothfuss, uh, Rothfuss, and he, this is by his own admission, um, he is not, uh, you know, takes him a long time to uh, work at the plot. But talk about voice and lyricism mm-hmm. in the writing, uh, Rothfuss is a master. So, you know, if you if you wrote out all the elements of craft, like the, the central ones like plot and voice uh, and characterization and uh, setting, et cetera, um, you know, writers come at varying levels of, of ability on these things. And of course, you, you work at them all. But writers are just different in this regard. And so having a, a sort of candid self-assessment of those things is really good so that when you are start looking for an editor, you can be proactive and say, hey, look, um, while I want you to look at all elements of craft uh, and, and get in on pacing and voice and all of these things, you can say, hey, there's, there's some things that I feel like I'm still growing at. Like, you know, maybe I'm not really good at characterization. So uh, I'm glad to take more input and more suggestion on um, character characterization. If you feel like your, you know, super, your superpower is plotting, you may say, you know, you're welcome to, uh, to the editor, you're welcome to provide plot input. Um, but if you're spending time and I'm, and I'm paying you by the hour, don't over index on plot because I've, I'm comfortable that I've arrived at good plot for the mm-hmm. book. So, you know, uh, and, and a way you can get at that is uh, having good beta readers um, who can give you candid feedback on elements of the book uh, or, or of your writing so that when you're looking for an editor. And then the other thing you can do is is you can ask the editor for their um, their list of titles and authors they've worked with and then call down on those authors and ask them about their experience and what those editors are good at, what they're not good at. Um, and, you know, so that you can pair yourself well with someone who uh, can um, help you build the best book. Because at the end of the day, what you're contracting for is someone who's not going to try and refashion the book in some way, but to help make the thing you've written the best it can be. And that's where I think, you know, that's the, sort of a major distinction in editors. There are some who um, don't seem to understand that their job is simply to um, yield the best story or the best book from the thing you've created. Uh, instead, they often are um, kind of remolding it um, after what they in they head, their head they think it should be. And um, you know, in the in the wild west of of editorial now, as writers are kind of becoming the publisher. Um, finding good editors is is key uh, because going into publication without that, um, that's what separates, I think, the successful um, self-published writers from the unsuccessful. Mm-hmm. And of course, as soon as I say that, there are counterexamples. But in the main, that's going to be true. Right. You uh, When you were talking earlier, uh, you mentioned, you used the phrase, a relationship of trust. So I got... Two last questions for you before we talk about your horrible writing experience. And these are going to come from a Facebook group. Those of you who are new to the show, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Come find us over on Facebook, Horrible Writing Writer Support Group. But Jennifer Worrell and author AC Ward had uh, questions that were close enough. I think I can squeeze them into one question for you. They wanted to know about how you, and I think you kind of hinted at, hit on this earlier. Jennifer wanted to know, how you know or how you feel out what editor advice comments will make slash break your 
your piece, your work. And then AC Ward had a closely related one to ask about how can you tell what's your warning sign that your voice is being edited out of your work? Well, I'll take the second one first. Um, and it's, it's really rather simple. Um, you know, voice is a, is there are a number of elements of voice. There's, um, word choice, which is key. Um, there's, um, uh, sentence length, the use of fragments, um, the, the character, you know, they'll have defining characteristics, uh, around hobbies and education and spiritual affinity, all of these things that are the makeup of who they are that influence the way they say things and um, where they come from when answering questions. So um, the writer, if they've done their work, they know the character, they know who they are and how they would respond, the words that they would use, um, their reactions to things, you know, their their emotions. And so if an editor is introducing um, or wanting to change language that uh, somehow is in conflict with everything the writer knows about the character and how they're going to interrelate with the world, then you, you just sort of immediately know. Um, and, and that is sometimes that is done um, without any sort of guile mm -hmm. um, or, or et cetera but on the editor's part. They just, you know, maybe they think an, another word is better um, and it, this happens all of the time when there's a, a word that can perfectly convey something um, that you could substitute for a number of words or uh, a lesser word or maybe a more highfalutin word. But the truth is, is it's not a word that the character would use. Mm -hmm. And so then it is out of character. And you've been, then what you've done is you've introduced a, a change or a slip in voice. So um, it, it's pretty I think it's it's very obvious to a writer when they see uh, a change in, and this can be syntax, you know, the, the, where, um, where clauses are used um, in a sentence. And, and I know that the, in, in the strictest sense, that there are the best ways to do that for clarity. And of course, clarity is really, really a key um, element of writing a book. But the, if if that were true, and we all use the same syntax, um, then we'd all have the same voice. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, I think the second one is, um, if the writer really understands the character well, then uh, any sort of editorial change that sa doesn't sound like that character, or if it's omniscient voice, same deal, then it's, you know, then it kind of rises to the altitude of the writer themselves or a, a narrator. They'll know if it sounds like the, the narrator that they, um, you know, and a, and a good trick for that is you can read it out loud. And usually that obviates, you know, um, a stumbling of uh, eloquence or of, of flow or of cadence or lyricism um, that the, the writer can hear. Um, now, the first question I'm going to ask you to repeat since I gave such a long answer to the second question. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Jennifer Worrell was asking about you almost start. I thought you were going to go with it right where you were talking about that. But the advice, comments, feedback that you get from the editor, how do you know, know when it's going to be advice that makes your work or breaks your work? Well, um, I'm not I, I, I'm not sure what she's asking there. There's there's one reading of her question that is, is it um, having a. A devastating impact on the whole um, story uh, in in a way that uh, creates it a success or failure. Um, in that case, you know that uh, if if that's the question, then you kind of look at the the depth of the editorial. Um, and I was talking about this earlier when in the sort of editor relationship, there are some editors who over edit, they get really, really deep. And, and the, the subtext there is that you've, you know, you're not a, a very competent writer because right. there need to be so many changes. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, is just as often as, you know, and, and sometimes that's the case. Sometimes writers are, are, um, don't have as much level of craft and, and that level of editorial is helpful. Uh, and sometimes not even to publish the book, but just to start learning the craft, having someone who really gets it, um, edit a book and look at the changes they're making um, can start to 
uh, suggest to the writer elements of craft that they need to work on. Um, but if you get that kind of a heavy edit, um, and it's and then you look at that and you see that there is a systemic problem with the book um, in you know clarity or um, whether or not the the engine of the story you know the, the plot is compelling and you know moving the char- moving the uh, reader forward the 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 editorial the comments and the revision and the redlining um, um, well, it won't be a secret. It won't be hard to deduce as you look at that. If it's uh, improving the book or whether it's just changing the book. And that's where, you know, I was talking about there are editors who revise voice and revise um, cadence and all of these kinds of things um, based on preference versus mm-hmm. what's best for the story or the manuscript they're working on. Um, when the writer reviews a deep edit like that, that where there's so much feedback, They'll, it'll be obvious if the feedback that is being given is improving the work or changing the work. Um, the other way to, to read that question is just um, not on the sort of the larger scale with the whole book, but whether or not, um, you know, at the, the small scale, like in a scene or in a, an, an interchange between characters or whatever the case may be, if the, the feedback is if is actually improving the passage and um, you know, I've never found it and, and writers are different. So I'm just kind of, I can go from my own experience, but I've never found it hard to um, deduce whether or not the changes are uh, in line with the character. If they're improving clarity or impact, um, you know, any number of ways that an edit could improve uh, a section or a piece of dialogue. Um, and when and the, the great news is that, um, you know, you can get a, a that kind of an edit and you throw away the stuff or, you know, if you're using track changes, you disallow on the stuff that you don't think improves it. Because mm-hmm. um, at the end of the day, the the editorial input, it, it's only its only function should be to improve what's already on the page. Uh, and if it doesn't, if all it's really doing is changing it, then you just disregard it. Uh, and there's a there's a degree of this that's just instinctive, but it grows out of the author's confidence mm-hmm. that they know the story they're trying to tell. I think you hit, you hit on that beautifully right there at the end. Uh, folks, if you need to rewind like a minute to really get down to what I mean, because, Peter, that's what I see quite often with the uh, newer writers who ask these questions of the show or in that group is it, it boils down to that confidence in that almost uh acquiescence to authority the editor is the be all end all and you know i i think those tips tools and tactics are really going to help a lot of folks push through those moments where they are looking at the uh sheet that's bleeding track changes and have the confidence to say you know not today thanks a lot appreciate it so last question on this uh agent or editor stuff nj boyer another upcoming author wants to know what are some of the red flags that you would recommend new writers look out for when it comes to working with a new editor? Well, um, one is responsiveness. So if you're emailing or communicating with your editor and you're not getting prompt responses, that's a problem. Um, it's true that so many of these folks are, are so overworked. They're managing huge lists of writers. Um, and, th- and that can be whether you're self-published or traditionally published. But you need, you know, you need someone who is communicative. So it's a huge red flag if they're not getting back to you. Um, the other, you know, and there's some other things. Uh, if you get um, editorial input, um, whether it's an, you know, usually you'll get an editorial letter if it's a traditionally published book, and then you'll get a manuscript with track changes. There are still some editors who um, write on hard copy, whatever the, the case is for how you receive the feedback. Um, uh, if you, if, if in reviewing, and by the way, the feedback is a gift. The, the feedback, you know, if it makes your book better, you should be really, really happy about that. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the, because that means it's going to be more successful uh, and a better experience for the reader. You're going to make more money, all of those good things. Um, But if you, the changes you see are 
refashioning the story, um, you know, reshaping the characters. If the changes are not consistent with um, the story you're trying to tell and the way you're trying to tell it, um, then that's a flag. And then, you know, then that's where you, you kind of press pause and you get on your phone with the, the editor and you say, hey, look, I really appreciate that you want to help me make this book the best it can be. Some of this feedback is changing character voice or it's changing plot. Uh, and you can say, are, are, you know, then you can ask probing questions. It's like, hey, look, um, tell me why you don't think the plot is working. And let's talk about that. And you know, you can you can decide whether you're misaligned um, mm-hmm. on what the what the story is um, with the characters. You, you know, you can advocate for the way you've written it, and you say, "Hey, look, this is who this character is. This is how they think. This is how they talk." So when I go through your feedback, anything that's not consistent with that, um, are you know, those are just changes that I I, I won't make. Um, not out of you know not out of any sort of intractability on my part. Uh, I just, I need to sort of keep the character voices consistent and resonant. Um, so the, the, a deep edit can, um, it's a gift, but you, as you review it, it'll be a flag if you see the editor rewriting your book. Um, and those are the, those are the big ones. If they're communicating, uh, your editor's communicating with you, and if you're kind of on the same page about the story you're writing, and then you're really just kind of in it to make the best book possible, mm-hmm. there aren't any red flags. Um, but those are the two big ones in my view. I appreciate that, Peter. Now, new listeners, if you've never listened to an episode before, I'm going to ask Peter an interesting question here. And some of you may not understand why I'm asking it. I'm going to ask him to share a horrible writing experience. It's on brand for the show, but that's not the only reason. Actually, the reason is, is because whatever Peter is about to say, and I have no idea what it is, we don't script this stuff out, but whatever he's about to share is something real, something that has happened to him in his own writing journey. But I want you to frame that. Look what, what Peter has accomplished. Look where he is in his author journey. He has come through whatever this thing is, and he's come out the other side probably a whole lot smarter and more experienced, but still surviving, still out there creating awesome things. We all can do this. We got to flip that paradigm sometimes, but we can all do this. Peter, with that said, I'd love to hear what your horrible writing experience is. Well, the truth about that for most writers is that um, with very few exceptions, writing careers are like a sine wave. And they go through crests and valleys and um, often will even the career will even crash and um, they can rebound with a great book. They can rebound uh, in uh, with a pseudonym. Um, But very few, very few writing careers kind of just follow this onward and upward, um, you know, sales trajectory and um, level of of brand acknowledgement from the the writer's name, et cetera. so with that said, you know, I am, well, I've been at this a while. I don't have a um, vast number of novels out. And my first con- book contract was um, with, uh, with Tor. And I, I got that through um, a, an author agent relationship where that, that was a consequence of me firing another agent. Um, so I have two kind of related, you know, there are actually many, and most writers have many, but two <laughs> related stories I'll tell you. And the first is that I self-published a, a collection of, of Christmas stories ages ago. And um, I, I sent that into an agent uh, that I was is very well known uh, in the genre fiction world. He writes his own books on writing and gives seminars on writing. and um, And he loved it. And he took me on as a client. Um, and then time started to progress. I had sent him, uh, I'd sent him my fan, big fantasy that ultimately Tor published and um, took him forever to get back to me on that. And I started to kind of worry about his level of commitment and involvement. And we finally met in Seattle for lunch one day. And um, he, he kind of went through the first chapter of my fantasy and basically proceeded to tell me that we were going to put this on the shelf and he wanted me to start writing the thriller books because uh, I had pitched him as a writer on wanting to write many genres, which I have done and, and want to do more of. Um, 
And so being new, I just sort of said, yes, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then fast forward, uh, I sent him in uh, two thrillers, which he sat on for so long. I finally just, and by the way, he'd been meaning to also sell my self-published book to a traditional publisher and try and get broader distribution and a marketing plan, et cetera. And nothing materialized. Um, And what I came to learn is that um, he had a couple of clients that he spent most of his attention on took on lots of new writers who weren't getting very much attention Mm -hmm. um, while he was writing his own books and creating his own sort of brand um, as a a fiction um, educator. And so I fired him. And, um, and I, I, by the way, I know a couple of other writers who fired him. I also know a couple of huge genre writers who are still with him. Um, So obviously agents work differently for different people. Mm -hmm. But um, that's what led to me. I was when I started to look for a new agent, um, I started submitting those thrillers that uh, I had written for him. And I got an agent who loved the writing, but it was hitting right at the time that Da Vinci Code was dominating the charts and Mm -hmm. uh, thriller fiction editors were all looking for the next Da Vinci Code. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, it's a bad time for thrillers. That's when I went back to him with my fantasy that had been on the shelf for eight or 10 years which he liked, he sent to tour and they bought. So there's this, this um, challenging agent author relationship uh, that I went through where I, you know, I, every young author, at least in my time, really, really wanted that agent. They thought that was the first huge step. And I felt the same way. And it was tough to have to fire him because I was then like kind of going back to, to square one. Um, and this is why I started with this idea that, um, not idea, this re- reality that writing careers go through these ups and downs. Um, so then I, I wound up at Tor and I got paired with uh, an editor. And um, I've talked about this a little bit, even in this interview, but there was a bad pairing. And that editor had one of the same problems. He was not communicative, wasn't getting back to me. And he was not taking any of my input on this this aged manuscript. And so that manuscript wound up getting published with all the flaws that I had told him I wanted to change. And that sent that series on the wrong trajectory, um, both for me and for Tor at the end of the day. Um, so the, the, the more awful experience was um, basically having a very sort of promising start with Tor uh, sullied a little bit by the the fact that this editor was not sort of committed. He was, and when he and when he did get into revision and editing, he um, he was ignoring any of my input and over editing to uh, you know create refashion the book in 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 his own with his own ideas, mm-hmm. and that um, you know that ended up uh, eventuating in a in a sort of reboot for me at Tor. But as any writer knows, um, it's it's really hard to to who's who's gone through this. It's really hard to reboot a series. Um, so the cautionary tale there is that across agents and editors, which is where you and I began, you need someone who is excited enough about your material that they're, they're they stay engaged, they stay communicative, um, because it's it's death if they don't, because it's a, it's basically just a tale tale sign that they're not really interested in your work. Uh, and then once they, you get to the point where they're engaged, um, they, ha- you have to be on the same page. And, um, if you've got an, an agent or an editor who is, um, has their own idea about what the book you're writing should be, um, then the fact that you're not aligned is, is going to spell disaster for you and your career. Mm-hmm. Th- thank you for sharing those stories, Peter. It's, it's an empowering, it's intimidating. I can understand why that would be intimidating for a lot of us to hear. It is for me as well. Uh, but it's encouraging to see that, uh, th- even with the significance of those, I mean, those could have been complete momentum stoppers for a lot of people and you were able to persevere through that. It's really encouraging. Now, I want to give folks that you shared so much for so many people and helped all of us on our journey. I want to give you an opportunity to kind of brag about yourself. For people who aren't familiar with you, though many of the people who found out you were going to be on the show were absolutely thrilled and wanted to know how I did it. And I didn't tell them that I tackled you at NorwestCon to get you to do this, but they are excited to hear about what you've got going on and maybe possibly what's coming out as well. 
Well, um, you know, the, the, to go from the general to the specific, um, if you like to tell stories, you know, if, if, at, if at the heart of things you're a writer or a storyteller, maybe a better term, um, then you, you know, you just keep doing it. And um, uh, if you do that, you're going to keep improving. And um, while there's no certainty that, that you can control only what you can control, which is your productivity. Um, so going through these challenges, um, it's possible to to persist and to succeed for sure. Uh, and there's always a, another angle to take on how to do that. Um, so I, you know, I've got I've still got a book left on a contract I have with Tor uh, to deliver, um, which is great because um, there's some wonderful people over there. Um, I, I, as because I have built a reputation around my writing and my understanding and passion for music, a lot of my writing has um, music as a factor. And so that led to my uh, being able to, to do the novelization of um, a concept album by my favorite band. And so it's a tie end, so to speak, in the same way that Star Wars or Star Trek might be uh, other, except that the, the band gave me, full license to create inside that world and to, to really blow it out and, and do things there. Most tie-in work doesn't give you that kind of freedom. Um, and so it was a, it was awesome for me to, I wrote a book called the astonishing, um, which is a tie into a dream theater album. And that was amazing. And it's led to some other work in that same regard that's coming out. Um, later this year, I'm doing, a, uh, another, uh, uh, piece of fiction that's tied to another album by uh, a member of that group. Uh, and then I, you know, because I've been in and around and just made friends, um, I I've had a forthcoming collaboration with Brandon Sanderson on an urban fantasy series, and um, you know that that also has a a music pivot. Um, and Brandon knew that I knew this culture, mm -hmm. and um, uh, he'd read my books and blurbed them, so uh, we we got talking about it one day and just found that we had this really great alignment. So you know, there's some there's there's still a lot of work to do to get that underway, but there's some real positive things that can grow out of all of this, despite where I came from. And so I've got, you know, I should have over the next year or two, I should have a new tour book, uh, another book out with a, a heavy music influence from a, a major metal band. And then the first in a series, new series, urban fantasy series with, you know, arguably one of the, the biggest, um, genre writers working right now uh -huh. um and that's just you know and and it might not happen that same exact way for everybody um but being i found that being congenial you know not being too um uh overbearing in your uh touch points you have with people in the in the trade um goes a long way uh, because they, everybody knows that we're all trying to make it. We're all we're all working hard to succeed. Um, but it's also easy to to sort of smell desperation. It, it nobody likes to be overwhelmed by or inundated by someone's requests or needs. So kind of establishing yourself as um, someone who's easy to work with, um, has a good attitude, has a good work ethic, um, creating that sort of. Uh, personal brand is really important and it can be hard early on because there's such a desire to succeed and uh, a desperation. Mm -hmm. um, you, you really have to hold that in check and just put yourself in the, in the places and times at conferences or uh, conventions um, that you build those relationships because over time they can bear fruit. I really appreciate you saying that. That's a uh, folks, that's just bonus content right there. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why I was absolutely thrilled to have you on because you showed it at the cons uh, that I've seen you at, just how giving you are when I approached you at this recent one about the interview. You were totally approachable and so giving of your time and you have been here. And now you wrap up an entire episode with a section where I was going to try to help you allow to pimp yourself out and you gave more helpful advice to other upcoming writers. That's just stand up stuff. It really is. I really, truly appreciate you doing that. Um for those of you who, for those of the listeners who really are interested in your work, what you've got going on, and those appropriate touch points, where can they find you on the internet? 
Um, my website is just my last name. So it's orulian.com, O-R-U-L-L-I-A-N. Um, most of my fiction, you know, the books, and um, I have a ton of short fiction that's been published. Um, all of that is up there. Some of the forthcoming stuff, uh, there's information about that. So the my website's the best place. And from there, you can also get to all of my social channels. So um, yeah, if you go to arulian.com, you can get information and other sort of um, news outlets I use or, or, you know, engagement outlets I use to talk with um, fans and, and writers uh, about any and everything. That is really cool. Uh, Peter, you have helped so many this morning. I know there were a ton looking forward to hearing this interview, which will be out in a couple of weeks. I want to really honestly thank you for your time and just, I mean, all the guidance that you shared with us today. Uh, you've been a wonderful guest to have on. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. Suck less.